Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today is very exciting. We um, have someone very special. We have Brother Ben Nora. He is um, from Tennessee. He is in Newfoundland preaching for us and I thought, uh, you know, let's have him and have an interview and uh, bless everyone out there. So, welcome back. Um, we're going to ask Brother Ben a few questions. We're going to kind of keep things a little bit casual and just, you know, have a good relaxed time. We're just going to ask him to feel free and relaxed and um, answer with the leadership of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so the first thing that I want to ask him, just in case people don't know him, which you should know him. If you don't know him, I don't know what you're doing with your life. <laughs> but um, if you don't know Brother Ben, I'm just going to ask him uh, just to kind of give us like an introduction of himself. Give us maybe just a little, a few lines of how you got into the ministry, like a background of how sure. God led you to the ministry. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah. First of all, thank you for having me and for conducting this interview with me. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to help the people in any way I can. Um, my name is Ben Norod, and I originally was born and raised in Ohio. I was born in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I was raised in the message and I was raised under my parents who came in in 1968 and um, I, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost when I was 14, 1991, mm -hmm. in a June camp, uh, youth camp, uh, that was led by Brother Mike Sievert in West Milton, Ohio. Oh, okay, BYC. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah. Yeah, you know, you, yeah, you, I was you know there. the camp. Yeah, I okay. was there last summer. Yeah, they've moved it since. You know, it's in Indiana now, but it used to be this old holiness campground, yeah. old fashioned, and, and everything was open air. And and uh, I received the Holy Ghost in that camp, and maybe perhaps a few months afterwards, that's when uh, the Lord started dealing with me to preach. You know, and of course that was farthest thing from my mind preaching I had no desire to preach whatsoever but it was something that when God first started dealing with me it it wasn't just one time that God came down and just started talking to me and said go preach and that was it it was something that started burning on me day and night night and day it's all I could think of it's all I could dream about it's all I could eat all I could sleep was preaching everywhere I turned around something about preaching I couldn't get away from it mm -hmm. and so I talked with some of the brothers that I was associated with, my pastor being one. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Mike Sievert was close there in Dayton, and, um, and we, we had, our family had a close relationship with him, and I spoke with him about preaching. Yeah. And uh, so I got my start, first of all, preaching in nursing homes with Brother Mike. They had like a little outreach ministry there. Yeah. And then my pastor has asked me to preach in his church, and as they say, the rest is history. So 26 start, years this June. Wow, that's great. So you started preaching at 14? At 14. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. I always find that to be really um, inspiring, uh, seeing such like a young person, you know, being called to the ministry, just me like too. my brother Eddie. He started preaching at 16. Right. At the moment, you know, I guess I was kind of used to it. Sure. But now when I look back, and I'm like, wow, he started preaching at 16. <laughs> like, people are doing so many things at 16, and there he yeah. is preaching. Like, so it's really great to see. It's a very you know, hard life. It's a yeah. very difficult thing to commit yourself to something so serious, so young. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't understand it. You don't really know what's behind it. Right. You don't know what kind of trials are laying ahead of you. But the one thing that you do know if you're called, mm -hmm. you're supposed to do it. And there's nothing that can tell you different. And right. It's amazing this many years later to see how the Lord's led me through the years and what I've gone through in ministry as yeah. a teenager. Yeah. Uh, those formative years coming up, you know, from 14 to 20, 21 years old yeah. was the very things that established who I am for now. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of stuff I had to give up. A lot of sacrifices had to be made, which are things that I have to do now. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, the trade-off was you can either go play basketball and be like everybody else, but not me. I'm in the corner with a Bible and a message book right. studying and everybody's having fun. Yeah, that was the same thing with Eli. Um, he was team captain, team captain of his hockey team. He was a sports star. He used to wear <laughs> Adidas, Nike, all these things. He, was, he used to wake up like 3 a.m. in the morning to listen to the, the cricket sports news and he gave it all up, wow. just dropped it. Incredible. Yeah. So it's just it's so great to see that, you know, it correlation. Is. So yeah, that's great. And Brother Ellie is a great man. He's a great preacher. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, he's a close friend too. I really thank a lot of Brother Ellie. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to dive right into the questions. Sure. So these questions are really random. They're not following any theme. 
I like the fact that you haven't seen the questions uh, so that you're gonna just kind of get a surprise and just we're gonna let it flow. I like unprepared speech, it's great. <laughs> just as long as there ain't nothing in about gluttony. We don't preach against that no. in the church. <laughs> okay, so the first question is going to be since you are an you since you're an in you are an evangelist, right? Um, you travel around a lot. You've been to India, you've been to Europe, you know, probably across the States, across Canada. Yes, um, I'm not sure, have you you've been to Africa, have you? Yes, three okay. times. Okay, great. So you've been around. I just want to ask, with all your traveling, mm -hmm. um, what differences have you seen uh, in the message, like from maybe from culture to culture, mm -hmm. or from country to country, or if that's too broad, just to make it easier, I always say the West versus the rest. Would that make sense for you? Sure. Yeah. Because like you yeah. know, the West kind of has their own thing going on, and then it's like the rest because the rest are more like cultural and in their sure. cultures. Could you just kind of enlighten us? Absolutely. And, you know, Absolutely. Our differences? And and honestly, Sister Lily, it's not really too broad of a question because oh, okay. most everything is is generalized in what Brother Bram taught about the two groups that he saw when he traveled. He said there's the formal group, and he said then there's the group that's like the Pentecostals, which is. He said, um, a train that has the steam on the engine, he said, that's like the fundamentals. You know, they know the Bible, they know the, you know, the ins and outs, the mechanics. And then he said the fundamental people were the ones that were sound, whereas the Pentecostal side of things always blew it out the whistle with a lot of supernatural but no foundation. Right. And in my experience, no matter where I've been, I've saw the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't really matter about cultures or whether it's, white, black, red, India, Africa, New Zealand, Honduras, no matter. Everybody has those central themes running through their lives. And it's interesting to see how that sometimes cultures affect people and maybe perhaps, um, uh, for example, in Africa, they're a whole lot more um, energetic and demonstrative in terms of the way they worship versus in New Zealand and uh, Nicaragua, they, they grab the back of the chair, they tilt their head and they don't move, they sing and they worship with their head tilted, their hands okay. on the chair and they don't really do much more than that sometimes. Uh, very quiet type people, very backward. Um, but in reality, you still see that same thread run through, run through both, both uh, those, those cultures and those, those, those two threads of uh, of a fundamental and the emotional or the supernatural leaning side. So it's interesting to see that because no matter what church I'm in, there's always a, a group of people in there that's pulling for supernatural and gifts and power of God. Then there's another group sitting in there, we just want the word and just teach us the revelations and teach us what Brother Bram said. And you know, so you can, it's really interesting to see that, that divide even yeah. amongst message people. Yeah. Um, it's not too much different now than what it was with Brother Brandon because people are people, right? I mean, right. It's the same today as it was then. Yeah. Um, but as far as culture, uh, in terms of like technology and, and those type of things or education in, in the West, um, I would say that even though fundamentally everybody has those same leanings, uh, the, two, the two sides, Really, the only thing that makes the big difference is that everybody's affected differently. So in the United States, North America, Canada, and, and our, our side of the world here, people have a tendency to be more affected by technology in terms of they'll allow that to dominate their life. Right. But in a third world country, um, they can have not a speck of technology, but be so full of pride or arrogance or um, you know trying to pull some kind of a shady deal other things. Yeah, that for them it's just the same as it would be for us. It's just, you know, just a different different vehicle that gets them there. So, yeah. in a way, the only thing, you, only difference as you really see is just, you know, the, the people are the same, but just what they deal with is different. You know? see. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, second question. Um, okay, so this was a question um, from <laughs> A young sister who reached out to me on social media because you know I kind of post a lot about Jesus and God and Brother and all that jazz. She saw that I, you know, I was a sister going to college and she was heading um, into college herself, and she wanted to talk to me on how to have that holy life going to college and how I, I do it. So you know, she skyped with me, we spoke, gave her some advice. I'm gonna give a shout out to her. Omotunda Esther, shout out girl. <laughs> okay, she, she said that in London she sees a lot of people backsliding. And she said that, you know, I, I'm scared. Like, what if I'm 
the next person. I gave her my advice, but what would you say? Well, first of all, everybody, no matter what nation you're a part of, no matter what group or what's going on around you, every person, every individual has to know that they are they're born again. They have to know that. Right. And it's essential, it's crucial that every individual has their own walk with the Lord. I cannot determine whether I'm going to make the rapture based on so-and-so does or does not make it. I have to be convinced that my walk with God is that I've met God's requirement of the Bible. I've been baptized, I've repented, I've done everything that God required. That confidence is what will establish a person no matter what's going on around them. You take, for example, in the in the days of the Babylon, uh, Babylonian king uh, um, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm trying to think of, excuse me. Um, when, Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar makes his decree that everybody in Israel will fall down and worship the image, which was Daniel, of course, there were four in the entire kingdom that chose not to do it. All the rest of those message people, they bowed down. When the trumpet sounded and the music was played, everybody else gave in. But because those men were convinced that the word was right, mm -hmm. didn't matter whether they lived or died, they were going to stay with what was right. right. They themselves were convinced. So my advice for this sister or for anybody that's listening yeah. is that you have to know for yourself that you've been born again. Mm -hmm. You can't guess. You can't suppose. You can't wonder. Yeah. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there's always going to be this fear element that surrounds your life. Because yeah. until you answer the sin question mm -hmm. of whether or not you truly have passed from death unto life, there's always something that's going to pull you. There's always something. And even when you're born again, mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning stages of your walk, there's still little questions and doubts that come around. Brother Bam called it an absolute or a tie post, we would say. So once you're anchored, then you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. I mean, really, really in a lot of ways, you know, as we come and go in the message, we're going to see more of this. I mean, the people leaving the message now, it's something that's, it's a trend that's not going to stop. Yep. The closer we get to the end, the worse I believe it's going to get. I yep. believe there are going to be people fall away for manifold reasons. Because right. we're coming to the nearing of the capstone, a razor's edge, where it gets smaller and smaller and fewer and fewer. Yep. And the elect of God is a little bitty group. It's not some majority of people out there, hundreds and hundreds. It's, it's a small little group. Yep. So... You have to know, if there's one going out of Georgia, he said, that I'm in Georgia because I'm that one. Or if there's one going out of Newfoundland, you know, it's because I'm that one. That's me. That's Coming right. out of Newfoundland. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you got to know that. Yeah. you got to know that. If you don't, then you haven't even got to the next step of your walk with God. Because step one is you got to know. you got to know that you're, you're born again. you got to know that. And right. if you ever meet God right and meet Him according to the conditions of His Bible, you will know that. Yeah. No questions asked. Amen. Yeah. Great. Third question. Okay. Believe the sign. So I asked this question at Kaya Kai Youth Retreat in 2014. I think you answered it really well. So I'm going to answer it again. I mean, ask it again for the crowd. With the whole believe the sign that has like come out in the last few years, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, obviously it's all over the internet. There's kids now growing up. We're on the internet. I guess my question is, how do we react? to believe the sign. Obviously there's people, um, you know, who get into debates with these people. There's people now going on their websites, checking it out. I personally don't go. My two videos that I uploaded on, on my YouTube channel, uh, but one of them just came hard for me and started sending me links. I'm not even interested in going on those links. Like, I know what I believe, right? But anyway, what is your advice um, as to how should we react towards now this whole believe the sign movement thing? <laughs> It's a great question, and first of all, our 20 minutes here is not going to cover oh, yeah, what I probably not. have to say about all this. Doesn't I mean, matter. We Go may ahead. have to have an entire different <laughs> segment just to get into all that. Yeah. I, I think I would truncate it by saying that it's sad to see what effect that the people who poorly represented this message has had upon those that began Believe the Sign. I actually feel very sorry for those people because... Um, it's obvious to me, as a minister, I do study and watch. I don't get as in-depth maybe as somebody else would, but I, I try to have an awareness about what they're getting at. Yeah. And so I've listened to some of their podcasts, and I've listened, I've read their articles, of course, The Humble Pie being the first one. And, yeah. and I, think it's, I think it's sad that people that they went to church with had hurt them so deeply, yeah. 
and so and, and they become so bitter about and and I know their argument is we're not bitter we're just trying to reveal truth but it it comes across just as scathing and just as cruel what they're doing as what was done to them you know and they they mentioned uh, one podcast I listened at the other day uh, this young lady was actually in the cabin with my wife was the counselor um, uh, in the winter youth retreat a number of years ago and you know she tells the story about her father who goes away to the Philippines leads a lucrative business he's there for nine years then he comes back and he follows this guy and this guy and this guy and and you know then they're blaming the message of course for all of their woes first and foremost my my way of addressing this would believe the sign is I always tell people that whenever you have a firm foundation scripturally of what you believe then you don't have to debate what it is that you're not supposed to believe you, you got to know what you believe first mm -hmm. and a lot of the damage that's been done to these people have been done from people in the message who haven't handled their business right uh, that goes for preachers deacons trustees housewives associate pastors painters farmers factors they haven't handled their business right they have not lived in the manner they need to or preached in the manner they need to to really project what the message is supposed to project which is not bitterness and cruelty and women women's do domination over women and, and and dominance over people's lives and it it has just become such a a gigantic thing in the ranks and and really the sad part is to be honest with you sister Lee, for 25 years us ministers and maybe even longer for the elders it's beyond my years we've been hollering that this day was coming anyways yeah. from the pulpits for years right. and when it showed up everybody was surprised that it, that it happened mm -hmm. The reality of it is, is that, is that this stuff has been going on all along. It's just that the internet has really illuminated the presence or the reality of of this this segregated group within the message that has had doubts for years. Just 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 a um, shy of a month ago, a close friend of mine as a pastor in the message, 17 years, um, walked right to the platform, announced the message said he'd study the Bible for the first time in his life and, and uh, now, now he sees that the message isn't right and renounced his church, close friend of mine. And uh, I, I, what was amazing is when we would have conversations, when him and I would talk back and forth, there was a lot of conversation about you know what the message people have done and how awful they are and this and that. So I'm going to suggest this and I'm going to advise this way that when people go to engage the Believe the Sign folks, not to just cast off that every word they're saying isn't true. I mean, I read today where Brother Bram said the biggest lie that was ever told had some truth in it. And these people are genuinely affected by the nonsense that's going on around the ranks of the message. They're genuinely affected by it. The reality of it is, is that, and I've said this for a long time, it isn't the Methodists or the Baptists or the Presbyterians that brings a bad light on this message. It's message people not living what they're supposed to that's brought the light on it. Now, that, that kind of begins the conversation of, okay, doctrinally, do we still believe the message? How do we respond to them doctrinally? I say we don't. Um, frankly, it's none of their business what I believe. It's none of my business what they believe. It's all of our business, though, however, to believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible to be the teacher of oneness of the Godhead, water baptism in Jesus Christ's name, the serpent seed, marriage and divorce, all of the things we believe about holiness, all of those things can be proven. And no matter how much these men on the internet want to pull out histories and, and, and separate, you know, as it was in the, in the council, diphthongs or sounds of Greek words just to try to figure out where Brother Brown was wrong at, I still go back to the reality that these men wasn't, they, they wasn't pushed around the world seven times. They didn't have an angel of God talk to them in their bedrooms. They didn't have any supernatural vindication that leads me to say that I should follow them. Right. All they're doing is debating behind a computer screen. Right. To me, I don't think that that's very courageous. I don't think it's gentlemanlike. I don't think that it's, it's a hero revealing truth. I think it's people that have been hurt, yeah. that have been offended by message people or preachers or whatever that haven't lived right. And rather than all of that be dealt with, then now they're kind of channeling all of that into these attacks. You know, um, I, I think it's it's genuinely sad when I listen to some of the podcasts from some of the so-called ex-believers that that 
was in churches and some of the stuff that went on in their lives and what people were allowed to get away with, it, it's sincerely bad. But there again, the counteractive to that, being able to go against the believe the sign thing is not to retaliate with the same bitterness. Yeah. You're attacking me and so now I'm gonna attack you, but it's to really get down to the foundation of what you are as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Not, am I a Branhamite? Am I a Branham follower? Am I, we're, we're Christians. Yeah. And Christians means, means we need to be saved. We need to repent. We need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need to go through all of those channels of God. And then once we're established as Christians, then we need to understand the doctrinal elements of what we believe. Who is God? What is God all about? Is He three people? Is He one person? Is He two? Is He a trinity or a twinity? Which one is God? You know, what does He look like? What is He like? What does He love? What does He appreciate? What does He hate? And I think if somebody would look at the message through that lens and not through the lens of bitterness, I think they could understand why I believe the sign is doing what they're doing. And that goes for John Collins, that goes for all of the ones that's been affected. I mean, these people are hurt, offended people. I sympathize, but again, they've got the same Bible I do. They've got the same ability to pray and ask God to reveal to them what's right as I do. And I'm not going to hide behind a computer screen or reach out to help other affected people. I'm going to concentrate on the fact that if I'm going to be a believer and I'm going to be ready for the rapture, I got to know for me what I believe. Yeah. You know, and the only way I'm going to help anybody else is to live the life of Christ. Right. Plain and simple. It has nothing to do with what links I put on the website. That's not going to save anybody. Mm -hmm. But living the Bible, living Christ out of my life, that's what the message is really all about. Right. And it's been missed. It's been ignored for uh, disagreements about this thing. And really, I call him the my, my brother and I. My, we talk a lot, and uh, he calls it the anti-Branham move. Yeah. And, and it is pretty much an anti-Branham move. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the Lord. It's yeah. just Brother Branham. That's their right. focus. Right. You know. Okay. That's the best I can do. Yeah. It may be long, but that's, I am a preacher. <laughs> yeah, no, you you feel free. No, that's good, that's good. Um, but you see what I'm saying? I mean, it, the bitterness drives a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So we can't turn around and let it poison us. Right, you know? right. Because the Bible's not to be debated, it's to be lived. Right. That's, that's really good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You guys listening? <laughs>